Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Our economy, our schools, they're really depending on us getting this right and fixing this. The urgent plea for everyone to do their part. By the end of next week, we should be up around 700 contact tracers. A surge in coronavirus leads to hiring of more contact tracers. 20-year-olds aren't invincible. They, they absolutely can get very sick from this disease. The scary statistics concerning young people and the coronavirus in our state. They always taught me to do what you love and love what you do. Honoring Claire Holder, a 2020 Louisiana young hero. Let's face it, Dee Dee doesn't like to be bested by Dad. Dee Dee Riley, a Louisiana legend who forever gave of herself. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, the COVID-19 numbers. The state passing the 100,000 mark for cases with an average of well over 2,000 cases each day of this week. Governor John Bell Edwards stressing that our numbers are not inflated. One case equals one person. In a Facebook post today, the governor says some are deliberately spreading misinformation and it's a terrible disservice. Also, White House Task Force Coordinator Dr. Deborah Burks warning local and state officials about a disturbing rise in positivity rates, especially in 12 cities, which includes New Orleans. Now, we'll look at other stories making headlines across our state. With the state now reporting just above 100,000 official COVID-19 case numbers, a new CDC study says the real case count, especially in the early days of the outbreak, was actually 16 times higher. It means by early April, at least 267,000 Louisianans were infected, or about one in every 17. Researchers say the study shows the virus was everywhere, far more than anyone knew. Louisiana is one of 10 areas across the U.S. in the CDC study based on routine blood screenings sampled. Because the coronavirus pandemic canceled the state's July bar exam, the state Supreme Court ordered this week recent law school graduates could practice law without it. But the court also said the graduates must take extra courses and go through mentoring by the end of next year to keep their law licenses. Shreveport Mayor Adrian Perkins announced he will run for the U.S. Senate against Republican Senator Bill Cassidy this November. Perkins announced his last-minute entrance with a video describing his Army career, overseas deployments, and graduation from West Point. He says Washington's poor handling of the coronavirus persuaded him to run. The state suspended an emergency rent assistance program to help with the economic slowdown caused by COVID-19 after more than 40,000 people started filling out applications in less than four days. The state housing corporation set aside $24 million of federal money and says it will try to find more after the flood of applications. About 280,000 unemployed Louisiana workers will receive their final $600 check from the government next week unless Congress renews the benefit set to expire July 31st. Those getting the benefit equal about one in every eight Louisianans who were working in February before the virus appeared and upended the U.S. economy. The pandemic has forced the Southwestern Athletic Conference to cancel fall sports, including football, and move seasons to the spring of 2021. It's huge for Southern and Grambling, two of the premier SWAC schools. It would also ultimately result in the cancellation of the Bayou Classic rival game between the Jags and Tigers in November. Dr. Sherwood Woody Gagliano, one of the founding fathers of the state's coastal program, died this past week at the age of 84. The geologist and archaeologist devoted his life to studying Louisiana's rapidly eroding coastline and helped develop a restoration plan for it.
Action for a COVID-19 vaccine has ramped up with large-scale trials soon to begin. That includes one from Moderna Biotech with thousands nationwide taking part, including seven to 800 volunteers from our state. The goal is to measure if the vaccine is ready for the world at large. I talked with Tulane University infectious disease specialist, Dr. David Mushat. 30,000 volunteers starting in July 27th over the course of the next few months will be given um, these new vaccines, but they'll be randomized 50-50 roughly to placebo versus the active vaccine. And what we're doing here is we're looking to see what happens to these people in the ensuing months. Do they, in the course of their normal lives, going about their business and potentially being exposed to COVID-19, do the people who get the vaccine get infected less often than the people who don't get the vaccine. And the best case scenario would be that people who get the vaccine don't get the infection or get a much milder version of the infection. Now that the vaccine is about to be rolled out, there's also a surge of cases in the United States. And so the timing is actually rather good to be able to test out a vaccine because what you don't want is you don't want a vaccine to roll out when there's almost no transmission because then it'll be very hard to show that it does any good. But with the large number of cases in many states and the increasing numbers, um, that increases or it speeds up the um, rapidity of the clinical trial in terms of reaching endpoints, which is people getting sick or, or not getting sick. This is the Moderna study. What about the Oxford study? Um, does one go first or get the lead if it uh, proves to be effective or, or sales through the trials with humans? Yeah, I, I think what will probably happen is um, – you know, I, I think there will be several, hopefully several vaccines that pan out. It, it will be good to have multiple manufacturers to be able to achieve the production volume that will be needed. But bottom line is, if we get reasonably effective vaccines, um, then the next challenge will be ramping up the production, distribution, and allocation of the vaccines. That will be a huge logistical effort that will take a lot of cooperation, a lot of uh, money and time. Uh, but I think it's. I think we're we're ready to rise to the occasion. I, I hope that Americans come together and uh, help. Uh, you know, uh, make this make this happen. Thank you, Dr. Mashat. We appreciate you. He says possibly the end of this year in a perfect world that inoculations could begin. But of course, we don't live in a perfect world. A recent study shows young Louisianans are on the wrong side of the coronavirus pandemic. And as they continue to drive the spike, health officials tell us they are very concerned. Flashing Louisiana billboards spell it out clearly, COVID-19 is not gone. Keep safe distances and stop the spread. But young Louisiana residents apparently aren't getting the message. Coronavirus cases in young adults, 30 and younger, have surpassed all other age groups. The way that you get COVID is you're social. You come into close contact with somebody, you have a really long discussion, and the virus is spread by breathing and coughing on people. So the most, more social you are, the more um, active you are in the community, the more likely you're going to get it, and the more likely you're going to spread it. And that's what young people do. They're social. They get together in big groups. And as all of those people who have comorbidities kind of pulled back from society a little bit, were more cautious, uh, young people just didn't feel that same fear of the disease. And so they've continued their social activity more than others. And we're seeing that that is the key to this is social activity. Dr. Catherine O'Neill is an infectious disease specialist at Our Lady of the Lake Medical Center and says young people are going to have to dial it back. If you think about a bar, um, it's you usually have loud music. So you're usually standing really close to each other. Some of the family spread that we've seen um, uh, admitted to the hospital, so family members, but who don't live in the same house. They were at a christening, a wedding, a baby shower. So same sort of thing, a lot of noise in the background. So we get close to each other to hear. We're talking in each other's faces, a lot of COVID spread from those kind of things. So um, we know that there were graduation parties associated with some increased spread. That graduation party in New Orleans, apparently a source of a virus spread to dozens and a cluster of outbreaks also being blamed at bars near LSU. More than 100 tested positive after partying there. More than 30 LSU players also infected at bars in Tigerland. So that's the same 
thing as we thought would have happened at Mardi Gras, a super spreader event. So for some reason that Tigerland bar had a couple of positive people who went and then because it was packed and because they were so close together, it was a super spreader event. Any type of gathering like that could be the same event same super spreader events. You have to have some positives who go and you have to have some really close contact. Um, so any bar situation is going to be like that. The state now reporting nearly 10,000 cases of victims between the ages of 18 and 29, the highest number of cases in any demographic in the state, about 20 percent of all cases across the state. You know, Dr. Burks told us last week when she was here that there are four things that we need to do as a community to decrease the numbers. And she said that if we did these things, it would decrease the numbers the same as if we went back to phase one, which nobody wants to go back to phase one. So it's masking, it's closing bars, it's keeping restaurants to 25% and decreasing your social activity by 50%. You do not have to stay home. You don't have to hide, but you have to decrease your activity. And if everybody decreased those interactions and did those things, then we would, it would be just like a stay-at-home order. So I think that's what we're asking 20-year-olds right now, is just decrease your activity. She says if you don't think it can happen to you because you're young and healthy, think again. We have multiple 20 and 30-year-olds in the ICU who can't breathe, who were healthy, who thought that they were the same type of person who could go out and do whatever they wanted to do. And we're seeing those people now that spread has gone up in that age group, we're seeing those people get very sick too. I think that telling those stories and saying 20 year olds aren't invincible. They, they absolutely can get very sick from this disease and it can be life threatening is a message we need to get out. And the doctor offered one more very important piece of advice. If you want to go to college and you want a new job and you want to be able to pay your bills, wear your mask. That's the key to, to getting back to normal. And um, you may not think you're going to get sick, but it's not just about getting sick. It's about going back to feeling like you're part of a community. Wear your mask. It's important to remember that while the reported cases of people under 30 are growing, cases of people over 30 are growing as well. If you tested positive for COVID-19, researchers with the Office of Public Health want to talk to you. Contact tracing has been ramped up even more in the last couple of weeks throughout the state as positive cases continue to go up. But answering a few questions for contact tracers could slow the spread. As the number of coronavirus cases continues to soar throughout the state, health officials are ramping up the number of contact tracers to slow the spread. As this all started out, of course, we were under a stay-at-home order uh, across the state, and there was not a lot of activity uh, outside of our homes. Um, and it was effective, and we saw in, uh, you know, flattening the curve and getting us away from the increase in cases we were seeing every day. Um, but unfortunately, now um, we've seen that uptick that you refer to. We've also seen an opening up of various sectors of the economy, which we know has a lot of benefits in terms of, you know, people's livelihoods, just their mental well-being. And we want to be able to continue to do that. But what we're seeing as uh, more cases have uh, been observed as that's happened, uh, what we want to be able to do is get in touch with people as early as possible uh, if they've been exposed as they're going about these more uh, activities that are more open in the community. And uh, that lets us continue to leave as many sectors of the economy open as possible. Omar Khalid is the chief of staff for the Louisiana Office of Public Health. He says it's a simple process. You'll get a call from the number you see on your screen, answer some questions, and hopefully the information you give will help others. But you have to take the call. We knew that this was going to be a big challenge for something that's uh, as manual a process as it is, right? We're, we're trying to get someone to talk to someone over the phone, which frankly just isn't done as much as it, as it has been in years past. Um, and understandably, uh, people are a little bit concerned about a number that they don't already recognize uh, giving them a call on their phone. So some steps that we've taken uh, to try to get around that is one, just having that single phone number. So what we decided to do is go with one, you know, 877, which is just like an 800 number. Try to get the word out that that's the number that will be used. Uh, an important part of that is that if you don't trust that call, if you're not sure, because you know, even like myself, I get a lot of calls. I'm not going to answer a call on my phone if I'm not expecting it. That's just the reality of the world we live in now. But we do leave a voicemail with a phone number that, well, that same phone number that allows people to 
can get back in touch with the contact tracing team that way. So they can listen to the, the voicemail, see that it's not a robocall or someone trying to sell something. With lags in testing and the length of time to get the results of those tests, many experts are starting to question if contact tracing can really be effective. Uh, of course, contact tracing works best when uh, it can be done. And the, the questions that are asked during the case interview of who you've been around, uh, when that can happen as quickly as possible. So obviously, um, everything everything that's built into that that uh, would delay that uh, is going to uh, have an impact on how effective it can be. Now, I will say, I think uh, it'll always have a positive impact as long as we're able to reach people um, and get them to modify their behavior and get in touch with people who may not know that they were exposed. It may not be as soon as we'd like in a perfect world, but it'll still have an impact if we can get to those people who maybe aren't symptomatic yet to let them know that uh, they may have been exposed uh, and to maybe monitor their own symptoms so that they can avoid exposing other people. And as we head closer to fall with schools reopening and the start of the flu season, Collett and other health experts say we need to be prepared for what could be a perfect storm to create an even greater health crisis. We're always concerned, uh, you know, with flu season. And then, of course, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic now and expecting to see, uh, you know, flu season is not going to take a year off for this either. So um, it's going to be that much more important that, uh, you know, people are uh, monitoring their own symptoms. They're uh, able to uh, get a flu vaccine, which is available, which should at least prevent, uh, you know, the likelihood that you're going to get the flu, or if you do, that it won't be as severe, uh, because we're also trying to watch out for, uh, of course, uh, COVID-19, uh, very widespread in Louisiana right now. So uh, all those things will, will make it very important to, to take this seriously and hopefully remind us to take those precautions, like, uh, you know, wearing a mask, uh, participating in contact tracing if you're called, just realizing that that's sort of the, the world that we're living in now, being able to participate in that process to help us um, will help us uh, stay ahead of what fall may bring. If you have questions about contact tracing, you can call 211. Two of the state's top government watchdog groups, PAR, Public Affairs Research Council, and Cable, Council for a Better Louisiana, are very active in this pandemic. I talked with Robert Travis Scott, president of PAR, and Barry Irwin, president of Cable. PAR tracks statistics of the virus with the goal of reaching solutions. Cable is urging everyone to take personal responsibility that's proven a difference between life and death. Our economy is vulnerable in general because of the COVID situation. We've got a big tourism, hospitality industry, uh, global ports and trades. That's, that's a big issue that we can't control. The same with the energy in industry. But we have a lot of other sectors that we can control. And what we diligently need to do is look at those sectors and say, if we want to keep them open, if we want people going back to those jobs and those businesses to be at least thriving to the degree that they can, we've got to follow these precautions that they're telling us to do. I know some people say, well, I don't want to wear a mask. Well, um, some people don't want to wear motorcycle helmets. But the fact of the matter is we have to do what things we can do to curb the, the spread of this virus. And, and we believe strongly that wearing the mask is something everybody needs to do. So when you talk about going forward, uh, I think you do have to look at this data. You do have to see what it says. And you do have to react to it and look for the reasons uh, that that's, that's going on. But that's the reason we put it out. Uh, it's not just as a general observation about uh, a disparity that we have in our society, but it gives you a lot of clues as to what you can do next to try to stem the outbreak. I think we need to kind of go back to that resolve we had at the beginning that even if you don't have to stay in your house all of the time, we do need to be careful and we do need to be responsible, not just for ourselves, but for others too. And I guess the last thing I'd say is our economy, our schools, they're really depending on us getting this right and fixing this. To say she's busy would be an understatement. Claire Holder, a Baton Rouge native, was taught early on the importance of helping others. And with the help of her very supportive parents, she graduated with honors and clocked more than 400 hours of volunteerism on her way to becoming a 2020 LPB Louisiana Young Hero despite the pandemic. Claire Holder is often booked, busy, and giving back in a big way. Combined with my school, my church, and my mom's sorority, I was able to balance out my academics, my athletics, and just combine it all to serve the community. More than 400 hours helping others, one annual project, an art camp. Which helped kids in the community while their parents were at work and they would um, learn about um, African-American history. They would learn how to paint, 
uh, work on communication skills. I also helped at Southside Gardens with in the nursing home and a retirement center, uh, feeding the um, residents, learning their lifestyles and just getting to know them and really interacting with them. And it was really inspiring and I loved it. Holder also a gifted multi-sport athlete. My athletic career kind of just sprung playing tennis with my grandfather and my dad in our carport. And then I always enjoyed running and just being active outside. So I started doing gymnastics when I was five at the little gym and then it kind of manifested and grew and I really enjoyed it and transferred to Bengal Gymnastics at LSU. I was a competitive gymnast there. And then also in eighth grade, I started running track. Her track career started by chance. The track coach at my school saw us in PE running around and he said, hey, you, you're kind of athletic. Let's see what you can do. With little hesitation, she literally jumped right in. The first event he put me on was hurdles. And I was kind of nervous because I had never run hurdles before. But then I grew to love it. Just the adrenaline rush running over them and just getting through. It was very great. And I just love doing sports so much. And as if her academics, volunteering, and sports weren't enough, she had lots of other school activities too. Throughout high school, I participated in Spanish Beta Key and National Honor Society at my school. And also, I was in Wealth of Theta as well and competed in competitions. And also, completing service with my school, we went to the Baton Rouge Food Bank for our senior service day. And we were able to package many tons of pounds of food for the community after the flood. How do you balance all your academic activities your sports activities, plus the activities you do throughout school, the school year. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's very difficult at times, but you, through prayer and organization, that's kind of how I got through. And with my parents constantly telling me, hey, and hey, re reminding me to do certain things and just staying on top of me and me also being the tenacious person that I am to handle it myself as well. Claire says it was her village made up of mentors, church members like the one who encouraged her mom to nominate her for Young Heroes and others wanting her to succeed that just poured into her, but none of it would have been possible without her mom and dad. I don't even know how they transported me to everything that I, from gymnastics in the evenings, three hours a night, to track practice, school events, service projects, just, all the time. They always managed to get me there on time or early and just always making sure that I was involved in the community, making sure that I knew my background, knew my history, making sure that I was a well-rounded person. And her parents couldn't be more proud. Claire makes my job as a mom, she makes me shine. And I don't know what I ever did that God blessed me with Claire, but I'm so grateful because she's dynamic in so many areas you know i just thank the lord every day you know for this child just just being able to do what she does you know in, in this covid situation i just like you said i was just kind of disappointed that she wasn't able to do everything that a senior gets to do but for claire who says the pandemic did make her senior year challenging at times it was the wealth of love and support she received that helped her give freely to others. When I do service projects with younger kids and I see the smiles on their faces and they come back and they say, hey, when I was having a bad day, you were there to help me and you were there to mentor me. And you really allowed me to see life from a different perspective. Claire told us one of her favorite quotes is by Odell Beckham Jr. And I quote, I didn't come this far to only come this far. Young Heroes is presented by the generous support of the Propane Dealers of Louisiana and additional sponsorship of Hancock Whitney, Community Coffee, Demco, and Hotel Indigo. A reminder, you can still vote in the annual PBS Film Festival. LPV is sponsoring To Infinity and Preston's Gone, two of the 25 films selected for online vote. You can watch and vote for LPV Films at lpv.org slash filmfest and vote by clicking on the heart button. The festival runs until July 26th. Anne Lamar Switzer, Dee Dee Riley, passed away this week at her home in Baton Rouge. She dedicated her life to her family and her community. She was a philanthropist who her daughter Anna says gave from the heart and not for recognition. Her family says Dee Dee Riley had a zest for adventure and a sincere desire to make life better any way she could. 
She was born in California and spent part of her childhood living across the U.S. because of her father's career in the Navy. That included time in Hawaii just after World War II. It's where she learned and loved the hula dance. When she was named an LPB Louisiana legend in 2017, her daughter, Anna Riley Cullinan, accepted the award in her behalf. One reason this recognition is so meaningful for mom is that dad was honored as a Louisiana legend several years ago. And let's face it, Dee Dee doesn't like to be bested by dad. <laughs> Dee Dee Riley was the most amazing lady. She had a wonderful way about her. She could listen to anybody, but she was always enthusiastic about whatever she supported. And fortunately for us, she loved LPB. Riley and her late husband, Kevin, helped create the Riley Center for Media and Public Affairs at LSU's Manship School. She helped found the Baton Rouge Speech and Hearing Foundation, now the Emerge Center, funded scholarships, and advocated for greater access to health care for women. She was actively involved intellectually. Certainly she loved to watch the news and she was an equal with everyone in her family discussing the current topics of the day. But most importantly, she was just full of life. I'll just miss her. Dee Dee Riley was 87. And everyone, that is our show for this week. LPB wants to make sure Louisianans' voices are heard in the national PBS American Portrait Storytelling Project. Choose a topic at pbs.org slash American Portrait, then submit your video, photo, or simply your thoughts. Share your story today. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Mora. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.